All right, how you doing? Kei te pēhia koutou? How you doing? Kei te ora. Kei te pai. Kei te ngenge. Tired. <laughs> Kei te hia mōr. Excited. That's what I am today. Kei te hia mōr. Kei te hia mōr nui. I'm very excited. Can I say it like that, Louise? Is that okay? Right. Or I am, my new word was karawe. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So I'm pretty excited. So we're starting this new series and doing an overview of the Bible. So going through five weeks. So the plan today, which is terrifying, but I'm really excited about, is to do an overview of the whole Bible in 30 minutes, which is kind of hilarious, but I'm pretty excited. And so, uh, and then over the next four weeks, we're going to do two on the Old Testament. Ailey, do you need to leave if you're going to be like talking during my sermon? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? I remember hearing a guy... I remember hearing of a guy back in the day who literally did that. Some people talked in a sermon, and he stopped the sermon, said, excuse me, ladies, you can leave. This is the Word of God. And I was like, wow, what a lovely guy. Anyway, you're welcome to stay, Ailey. You can talk to the sermon. I don't care. Oh, okay. All right. I don't know. So Ailey works here, so I can be a little bit rude. And she's from Scotland, and they're just crazy, right? What's up with haggises and kilts and bagpipes? I don't even know. Anyway, I need to focus. So over the next um, five weeks, we're doing this overview of the Bible today, doing a big overview of the Bible, and then the next two Sundays will be like two overviews of the Old Testament, and then the following two Sundays, um, two overviews of the New Testament. So one will be on Jesus, and one will be on the church and kind of end times. So that's kind of where we're going. So um, this was just an idea that the elders had when we were talking about these posters that we've been working through. Um, so of to do a big picture, how does the whole Bible fit together, what are some of the key themes and threads, so obviously there's no way I can like unpack the Bible in 30 minutes, because we'd be here for a couple of years, um, so I'm just following a couple of key themes, right, so two, three, hey, kia ora, Pierce. good to see you bro, kia ora, man, um, just going to follow two key themes through it, which got me pretty excited to be honest when I was preparing this week, so um, let me do a pray, I'm feeling a weird, so let me pray and unweird myself, hmm. Yeah, Morena Atua. Um, yeah, thanks that you are. I don't know, I think desperate is not the right word, but you're so um, strongly desirous of a relationship with us because you know when we connect with you, it's good. When we disobey you, when we go our own way, it's bad. Every time, God. Um, yeah, I just pray for us as we. Just try and look at this, the big picture of the Bible. What What is some of the big themes, the big threads that you have woven through the whole of human history that maybe you really want us to understand more and see as we go through this? So, yeah, speak to us. Give me focus and concentration this morning, God. Um, help me to unpack these ideas that I think, I don't know, you and I have been working on this week, God, um, that I can communicate them clearly and give us good ears to hear what you want to say. Hey, yeah. Yeah, I pray this in the name of Jesus. I mean, hey, kia ora, podcast people, kia ora to the video people. Just to the video people, we love you so much. And I know some of you live in Kirikiriroa or around this area. Um, so I'd love to encourage you to come down. Most of us in this church are nice and friendly. There's a few weird people. So I'll point them out when you come in and you can avoid... No, I'm joking. Um, but we'd love you to join us, eh? So I know some of you are watching pretty regularly. And I know church can be real scary. And maybe you're struggling with anxiety or depression or something. But... Yeah, just wanted to really invite you and say, whoever you are, we love you, we'd love to pray for you, um, but we'd love to invite you to come and be part of our community. So, But feel free to keep connecting online, that's just awesome, so super cool. All right, so we're doing this kind of overview of the Bible. So I've broken it down into five kind of sections, um, if you like, and you could break it down into all sorts of different ways, right? But I've broken it down into five different sections. And uh, like I was saying, one of the reasons we wanted to do this and talking to different people um, there's a lot of people that if you said to them, how does this fit into the Bible, this thing? Oh, I don't know. How does this story fit into the Bible? I don't know. How does David and Goliath? I don't know. How does, uh, it's like, oh, I don't know. So let's do some big overview stuff. That's kind of where we're going. So I want to start with a funny story. This is, I don't think this is true. I just read this this week and I thought it was hilarious. It's talking about the lack of understanding of Bible and Jesus and all that around. So a police inspector uh, went to visit a primary school where he was asked to take a scripture class. He began by asking, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? There was a long silence as the children shuffled nervously in their seats. Eventually, a little lad put up his hand and said, please, sir, 
My name is Bruce Jones. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't me. <laughs> the policeman thought that reply very cheeky, so he reported the incident to his headmaster. After a pause, the headmaster replied, I know Bruce Jones. He's an honest chap. If he said he didn't do it, then he didn't do it. <laughs> The inspector was exasperated. The headmaster was either rude or very ignorant. The inspector wrote to the Department of Education to complain and received this response. Dear sir, we're sorry to hear about the walls of Jericho and that nobody has admitted causing the damage. If you send us an estimate, we'll see what we can do about covering the cost. Ah, funny, right? Um, so back to mildly serious. In the last three weeks, I've talked to, in the last two weeks rather, I've talked to three people that I can remember clearly now who've had conversations with people in Kirikiriroa, in Hamilton, with people that had no understanding, had never heard of this thing called the Bible, never heard of the cross, never heard of Jesus, right? Um, and so for us as Christians to have a, a better understanding, a bigger understanding of the Bible and the threads and the themes, I think is just super vital, right? Okay, so here we go. I've got five little um, thoughts. And again, I know some of this will be like, whoa, there's so much information, but don't forget over the next four weeks, we'll kind of keep unpacking this. So that's kind of where we're going. So here's the first one, right? Amago Day. So turn to someone beside you and say, Amago Day. So you say, Amago, Amago Day, Amago Day. So Amago Day is the uh, Latin translation of the image of God. So Amago, image, day, God. So talking about the image of God. And this is one of the crucial threads, themes, whatever you want to call it, that you see going right through the whole Bible, right? Which means that we as humans are different from the rest of creation because we are created in the image of God. Um, let's read the little passage, right? So you guys know this passage. Most of you could probably quote it. Um, but jump over to Genesis 1, and we'll read 26 and 27. And then I'm going to read this quote that I just got so excited when I read this quote this week. It just made me go, whoa, that's so cool. So Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27. So if, just to give you the context, if, you'd been, if we'd read through the whole of Genesis 1, 10 times you would have heard the writer Moses, inspired by God, talking about how all of creation was done according to their kind, and they will reproduce according to their kind. And he keeps talking about this, which we would say is, is genus, right? Genus, we know that. And so he keeps saying this, he keeps saying this, and you expect when it gets to humans for it to say humans were created according to their kind, this kind now of humans, this class of humans. But he doesn't say that. It's totally different. And so if we read through it, we'd get here and we'd be like, what just happened? So I'm going to read it, and then I'll read you this quote that explains what I just said. So verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So in our image, that's that Imago Dei, right? The image of God to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image, which is like, when you're reading the story, because you're like, what just happened? He created this next creation? Imago Dei in the image of God? What is, whoa, that's just wild. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. So let me read this quote. So he's talking about how you'd read this, this 10 times you've read this according to their kind, according to their kind, according to their kind. And then we get to the creation of humans. And it's like, whoa, what just happened? It's quite sudden. So let me read this. There's two slides for this quote. When God makes man, he breaks the pattern that he set by creating living things according to their kinds. The tenfold mention of this pattern causes us to expect it with each new living creature to appear. But something quite different happens when man is made. He is not made according to his kind, so according to the kind of people. Neither is man created according to any other kind among the living creatures. Man does not, therefore, belong to their kinds, whatever similarities there may be between him and the other creatures. So this next slide gets me so excited, I just about pop. Man is unlike any of the other living creatures, verse 26. Surprising as it is, man is made according to God's kind, made in the image of God, Imago Dei. Man, like God, is a personal being. But what is most important about human persons is their likeness to God. This likeness is so very special that it sets them apart from all the other creatures God made. Man is not made according to their kinds, he is made according to God's kind. In other words, man is made as the image and likeness of God. Oh, that's cool. No? Oh my gosh. When I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, the whole 
the cleverness of the way God inspired Moses to write it. It's like kind, 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 and we expect him to say, and God created humans according to their kind, and they will produce according to their kind. It's like, no, we're created according to the kind of God because we are in the image of God. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I got so excited, it was ridiculous. So, all good. So what does that mean, just real briefly, right? Um, that we're made in the image of God. It doesn't mean um, physical. So when I was at the Bible college, I remember a student coming up after one of the lectures going, hang on, hang on, hang on. God is spirit. I, how am I in the image of God? And I was like, whoa, 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 it's not physical, right? It means emotional and spiritual and, and mental. So God is good. We are good. God is wrathful. We have wrath. God is just, merciful, compassionate, right? There's all these attributes that God has that flow through to us that we are made in the, the image of God, that we reflect the divine, right? We're not divine, but we reflect his nature. So one of the big threads that you see through the Bible is this, this natural desire for God to be with his people and for the people of God to be with God because we're in his image. There's this natural desire for connection. Does it make sense, eh? Not with animals because they're not a Mago Day, but we're a Mago Day, so God just desires to connect with us because we're in his image. We have a natural, inherent desire to connect with God because we're in his image. We are a Mago Day, right? So that's one of the big threads you see the whole way through. God's constantly saying, ah, oh, I want to be with you. I want you to be my people. And we should be saying, ah, oh, I want you to be my God. I want to be with you. And then we get to the craziest verse ever that I love reading with a weird sound. <laughs> Genesis 3.1. I'll read this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, hmm, did God really say? <laughs> he must not. Have. He starts questioning um, God as he does. And I love in that video how they just kept having kind of Satan sneaking in just constantly through human history, making us question God, causing us to question God. Um, causing us to go, does, does God really have my best interests at heart? That's the easiest way I say it. Can I really trust God? Um, an, an easy way to say it, and to me this is one of the other big threads, is do I obey God or do I obey myself? Do I obey God or do I obey myself? So one of the threads is this natural desire of God to be with his people and us to be with, with God. And another thread we see through the whole of the Bible is this, do I obey God, do I obey myself? Do I obey God? Do I obey myself? And you see it right at the beginning, right, in Genesis. The first people, the first <laughs> big decision they have to make, obey God, obey myself. And then you're, you're going to see it the whole way through as we keep going. Are you with me, eh? Two threads? You all good? Cool. Okay, so let's fast forward like a thousand years. <laughs> um, Israel. This is a picture of um, Masada, which is a beautiful, long story, very interesting place. Um, so Israel, one of the key things that we see about Israel is they are chosen by God right? Chosen by God. And a big key theme that goes through the whole Old Testament that heaps of you know, right, is that Israel was chosen by God to be a light to the nations, right? To be a light to the nations. And one of the things that, and I'm going to look at some verses in a minute, but one of the things you see constantly through the, the history of Israel is God chose them to be his special people, and he wanted to pour blessing on them and have them flourish and have their crops just go crazy and their animals have 50 lambs every time, which would be impossible because the sheep would explode, but you know what I mean? And the whole idea is that they're just going to be so blessed because they're being the people of God and God's being their God. Remember that's that theme? That they're going to do that. And so all the nations around, I'm now another nation standing over here, are going to be like, what the heck is going on with these people? How come their lambs are just, you know, whatever? How come their crops are, ah, what is going on? Oh, it's because they're the people of God, and God is their, oh my God, how do we get on in this? How do we get on in this, right? So that's this key thing you see the whole way through the Old Testament, that Israel was this, this chosen people of God to be blessed by him. But as we know, <laughs> they do the Adam and Eve trick, and they keep saying, hmm, obey God or obey myself. I'll obey myself. And they just keep messing up, keep messing up, keep messing up. Keep messing up. Oh, my gosh. Hey, let's read these verses from Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy 4. If you've got your Bible, I know it's like a huge effort to click or turn, but I'd strongly encourage you to do it because last time I checked, this literally is the Word of God. It's kind of worth reading, I think. <laughs> um, Deuteronomy 4, 6, and 8, and this explains what I'm talking about, right? So it says, oh, he's talking about the laws that they are receiving. This is Moses talking about the laws they are receiving. 
from God right at the beginning of the history of Israel. He says, obey them completely, and this, this is that key thing. You will display your wisdom and intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these degrees, they, these decrees, they will explain, whoa, how wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as this body of instructions that I'm giving you today? So this is this core cool thing, right? One of the, the, the key aspects of, of Israel is to be this light, that as they serve God and follow God, they receive his blessing morally as well as physically, and that all the nations are just like, how do we get in on this, right? How, how, do, we, how do we get in on that? Pretty, I don't know, pretty strong, I think, through the whole, um, the whole Old Testament. Again, this, this key theme that you just see again and again, and, and the, the phrase is actually in the Bible, in the Old Testament, so many times where it talks about God saying, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. And as we all know, again and again, they're like, nah, 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 nah. Um, and the easy way to think of it when you're thinking of the big picture of the Bible is just keep going back to Adam and Eve because the whole of human history just reflects their decisions in the garden. So you see Israel choosing to follow God or not, and they're reflecting what Adam and Eve did. They chose not to follow God, to follow themselves. The further you get through, they just keep this messing up. But because God is so faithful and so trusting, he keeps forgiving them, he keeps restoring them, he keeps inviting them back um, again and again. And as we saw in the video, by the time you get towards the end of the Old Testament, everything is just completely turning to custard, right? Instead of these people being this light and they're receiving blessing and they're following God instead of following themselves, they're doing the complete opposite. And so you end up with the, the nation splitting, which is like the worst thing for God because they're his people. Why are they splitting? And then you have the 10 tribes and you have of Israel and Judah and then they're fighting each other, they're fighting everyone else. And then finally God's done with them and they get taken into captivity. And you're reading the story just going, what, what, what? the whole point back in the garden was the people to be with God and, and God to be with his people. Now there is no people. They've been dispersed. What just out of this? And then 70 years after Judah goes into captivity, God brings them back, but it's a real messed up remnant and they build this temple and it's lame compared to the previous one. And you get to the end of the Old Testament and you're just kind of like, this whole thing stinks. <laughs> this whole thing is a really sad, depressing story. It was meant to be glorious. It was meant to be, remember, God being with his people and the people being with God and God's walking and the cool of the garden and he's with them and it's beautiful and they messed that up. But then there was this new plan where God was going to choose a people. There'd be a light and it was going to be amazing and everyone around was going to be like, whoa, look at that. How do we get on in it? And instead they obeyed themselves instead of obeying God. And it just keeps falling apart. So you get to the end of the Old Testament and you're just like, what? What has even happened? <laughs> and then there's 400 years of silence which is a big point, I think, of God saying, pause, <laughs> reflect, <laughs> what more can I do? What more can I do? I sent prophet after prophet. I came, you know, it's just like, ah, oh, just messed up, messed up. But, and we're going to read another verse in a minute, the whole way through, right from Genesis chapter 3, <laughs> when God gives the, the punishment to Adam and Eve, remember? And he punishes the snake, and he says to the snake, you will bite his heel, but he will crush your head. And we're like, what? Who is he talking about? And then the whole way through the Old Testament, there's this little thread of this one who's coming. We keep stuffing up as humans. We keep stuffing up as humans, but there's this one coming who won't. And there's mass confusion. You read through the Old Testament, there's mass, con mass confusion in Israel going, who is this one? This one that's coming, he's, he's going to be perfect in some way. He's going to make everything right. But every time humans try, they mess it up. What is happening? And there's this, this really powerful thread of hope the whole way through the Old Testament that most of the time Israel was completely confused on. They just have no idea. How, how could someone come who's perfect and right? And uh... All right, time for you all to think. So grab a friend, answer some questions. Here's two questions kind of an easy one and then a bit more of a grunty one, so you can choose whichever one or both if you want to. Um, what is your favorite story in the Old Testament and why? And then question number two, what other threads do you see weaving through the whole Bible? So we're just going to take like a minute. So if you're visiting with us, um, we do this pretty often. Hey, just kind of stop the sermon and have a bit of a chat. So I will continue preaching afterwards, which some of you will be like, yay, and some of you will be like, no, really? 
Um, if you're a year really, then talk to me afterwards and I'll just burst into tears. Um, so if you're a visitor, the deal is if you stare at the screen, then no one will bug you because maybe you and God are going to have a serious talk. But if you're not staring at the screen, people will now pounce on you and talk with you. So grab a friend, grab a question, have a little chat for a few minutes. Kia ora. What's your favourite swim now? Just none of mine. Why? Yeah, that's cool. Alrighty, kia ora. We'll just do this. Normally now, if you're a visitor, normally we'd take five or more minutes to hear some thoughts and discussions that we've kind of got a papaya because I'm trying to get through the entire Bible in 30 minutes. So, but real fast, any, any other like threads? There's tons of threads that you see in the Old Testament and, and through the Bible. Any other threads that people are like, ooh, ooh. Any favorite stories then from the Bible? What's your favorite story, Jade? Moses, yeah. Growth, yeah. Like, like, that yeah, that's wild, eh? Yeah, that's cool. Jade's saying the story of Moses, how he starts so low, goes to a high place, so he has to give all that up to really become even higher, right? It's amazing, yeah. My favorite thing about Moses, the 40s. Does anyone know the 40s? So he dies at 120, he's 40 years in Egypt, then he's 40 years in the wilderness, then he's 40 years as the prophet leading the people. I'm like, Psh, this is so weird. You know, one more, that was a random free thought. Rachel, I'm very nervous with your excitement. Um, I, I, I ah, cool. Well, yeah. 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 Hopefully I didn't twist it, but I explained it maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just saw the video on that. So Rachel's saying the story of Abraham and Isaac, which is quite a wild one, because what kind of God calls someone they love to sacrifice their child? And Abraham just does it, it seems to be so willingly, right? But... Yeah, there's a whole thread in there of him knowing that God's got a plan, I think. And all, good. all right, hey, let's boogie on. So we're, we're finishing Israel, we're finishing the Old Testament, and I said there's this, this thread of hope through the whole Old Testament that a lot of people miss. So if you've got your Bible, jump over to Isaiah 49, um, 5 and 6. There's a ton of these, these threads. It really is just such a very strong thread that there's this one coming who will put all things right, and it's quite phenomenal. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously talking of Jesus. If you're like, ooh, what's the thread? Then Jesus. So don't forget in church, anyone ask you a question, the answer is Jesus. Just that always, and you'll rewrite. Okay, um, verse 5 of Isaiah 49. Um, and now the Lord speaks, the one who formed me in my mother's womb, to be his servant, who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him. What a massive statement, right? The Lord has honored me, and my God has given me strength. He says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. 
I will make you a light to the Gentiles. Is that phrase again, right? Light to the Gentiles. You will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So there's phrases like that the whole way through the Old Testament. So most Israelite or Jewish people in the Old Testament are very confused on who or what. Is it the nation going to be this? What is, is happening, right? But the idea is you, well, not the idea, the, the, a key thing to me is always you end the Old Testament and it's just despair, and it's just failure, and it's just sin and depravity, and like, ooh. And then you kind of turn the page from Malachi, or Malachi, the Italian, Italian prophet, as I call him. You turn the page from Malachi, and you're just like, Psh, what the heck just happened? Who is this one? And if you'd been following that thread, you'd go, oh my gosh, it's the one, it's the one. <laughs> you feel excited, right? Jesus is the next part, Jesus saves, and it's this incredible reality that all through the Old Testament, they're just waiting, they're confused, they're failing. No one can follow God. No one can be the true Imago Dei, right? Everyone mars that image of God. They just mess up. And then all of a sudden, psh, there's this one that comes, born of a virgin. You're like, what? Oh, I get so excited. So Jesus comes, and changes everything, right? One of the big things that Jesus does, and I'm going to unpack this a bit more in a second, but one of the big things Jesus does is he finally makes people right with God. That's a key thing, right? And that's what they'd been longing for in the Old Testament. So this is, a, this is kind of obvious, but important to remember. So in the Old Testament, they're, they're sacrificing animals, which God told them to do, sacrificing animals in their place to try and remove their sin, right? But they know that doesn't work. They know that doesn't work because the animals are not Imago Dei, Right? The animals are not made in the image of God, so they, they're being faithful, doing what God says, but they're doing this going, this can't remove our sin. But the thread, there's this one coming who will make it right. We don't know how, but there's one coming who will make it right. So one of the key reasons for Jesus coming is to bring people back to God. The other thing that's just kind of wild, the reason for Jesus coming, is that he will change people, I'm going to say this carefully, more than just spiritually, he changes them emotionally, mentally, and in a, in a sense, physically, when they finally become the true Imago Dei because of his sacrifice to be people that are just now hungry for God. In the Old Testament, they kept cha following God and disappearing, following God and failing, following God and failing, obey themselves, obey God. It's just a mess. But there's this, this clear message in the Old Testament that when this Messiah comes, this chosen one comes, he will literally change people. And, and you read these verses. I put them on the screen because I got too excited and I didn't want to just flick to them, right? Ezekiel, this is way back in the Old Testament. It's talking about this future one coming. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart. That's the heart we see all the way through the Old Testament, right? Adam and Eve, Israel, stony, stubborn. And give you a tender, responsive heart. I'll put my spirit. Aye, that's the trick. I'll put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Same thing in Jeremiah 31, which um, Matt read before, but this is the new covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my instructions deep within them. I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be their, my people. That's that phrase, right? I will be their God. They'll be my people. It's all the way through. The, one of the massive changes that Jesus brings, this Messiah brings, is... He makes people right with God, and in making them right with God, he puts the Holy Spirit within us, right? We read that in the, in the New Testament. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came on people to anoint them for special ministry. He'd come on them and anoint them with power or battle or whatever, and then he'd leave. He'd come, he'd leave. And one of the massive changes that the Messiah, this chosen one, brings is that we have the Spirit dwelling in us. And he really does change us. You see it, eh? He says he'd give them a new heart. We're totally changed. So now finally, we should be <laughs> not obeying ourselves but obeying God. Finally, we should be the ones that say, yes, he is my God. We are his people, right? So again, I'm, I'm going to unpack this all more when we do the New Testament part and Jesus part. But I kind of broke down four keys, I mean there's a ton of keys, but four of the kind of key aspects I see coming out in the life of Jesus. And each of these get me more and more excited until I nearly scream and go running out of the room. Here's the first one, Jesus defeats Satan and temptation, right? Jesus defeats Satan and temptation. Now, and I know you guys know this, but when you're reading the life of Jesus and you get to that temptation from Satan, you have to just get so excited because you finally see one 
Remember in the video, Satan's slithering around with his, his tongue, um, slithering around. Um, you start reading it, and you're like, oh my gosh, we've just backtracked right back to Genesis 1. Genesis 2, what happened here? Satan has come, and he's challenging someone who is Imago Day, and he's twisting the Word of God again, remember, with Jesus, and saying, did God really say? And instead of Adam and Eve, who are like, well, that's a good point, Satan. Thank you for pointing that out. Actually, this fruit does look good to the body and eating. I think I'll just have some. And then, you know, everything turns to custard. Tried it with Israel. Turns to custard. Satan tries it with Jesus. What does Jesus do? Oh, interesting, Satan. Let me quote scripture back at you. Satan comes at him again. Another scripture. Another scripture. I just love it, eh? Oh, my gosh. Um, when you're reading that story of Jesus, you're going, hang on a minute. This is the chosen one. This is the Messiah, the thread we saw. And then you see Satan come, and you're kind of on the edge of your seat going, what's going to happen this time? What's going to happen this time? Is this Imago Day? this person in the image of God, finally going to fight him and win, or are we in? Ah, he did. And you're like, what? I'm a lot more excited than all of you, but that's okay. My excitement this morning is enough for all of you, so it's all good. I just get excited when you see it this kind of clearly, right? It's like, wow, he beat him. <laughs> he beat him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Finally, there's someone who obeys God and doesn't obey themselves, which is what we keep seeing, right? Another thing that Jesus does, and this is kind of massive, right? Jesus explains the original tent of the Old Testament. Um, it's a relationship, not a legalistic religion. It's so sad. And you see this the whole way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the story of Jesus again and again. Jesus is saying things like, you've heard it said, <laughs> but let me explain to you. You've heard it said, but let me explain to you. And, and you guys know, right, the Jewish leaders, I want to say out of a good intentions, but the way Jesus challenges them, I'm not so sure. They have turned this cool relationship with God. They've turned this God dwelling with his people. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. They've turned this God walking in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve and just chatting about their day. How'd it go today, Adam? What did you end up naming that weird thing with the beak and the tail? And oh, I came up with a platypus, and God's like, man, good job. That's the weirdest creature I made. You know, what did you do with that one with the long trunk thing? And what did you call that one? I called it an elephant. Whoa. I mean, I know they're speaking a different name. You know what I mean? Just hanging out, right? That's what God wants to do. Just dwell with us. And the Jewish leaders have turned it into this legalistic laws and rules and structure, and this zero relationship. There's zero communing, there's zero dwelling, there's zero abiding with God. And Jesus flips all that, and he's like, no, 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 no. It's a relationship, it's connection, it's community, it's being, right? I just love that. He does that huge, right? Another one, and this to me is just so massive, Jesus shows who God really is. One of the saddest things you see as you read through the Old Testament is they have just totally lost who is God. And they put him into this very structured, legalistic box of he's separate and he's judgmental and he's angry and he destroys. And Jesus comes and goes, whoa, 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 that is not who, and he never says it, but he could say we are, because <laughs> he is God, he is the Trinity. And this is one of my favorite verses when Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples, this one's to Philip, about who he really is. I, I love this. So, oops, oh, sorry. So Jesus shows who God is. Um, here's this verse, John 14, 9 to 11. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own. But my Father who lives in me does his work. That's the key phrase, work. I'll come back to that, in me, uh, through me. Just believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. And then this last sentence is real crucial. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do, right? At least believe because of the work you've seen me do. And Jesus is saying to Philip and to us, if you want to know who God is, look at who I am, Jesus says. Look at what I do. Now, jump back to those verses that Matt read before. In the Old Testament, we see God define himself to Moses. So Matt read it super well. I'm going to read just a little bit again. So Moses is on Mount Sinai, and he wants to understand more of who God is. And God's like, yep. God kind of hides him in this kind of hole in the rocks. And as he passes by, God says this. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh. 
the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Israel totally loses this. They've completely lost this image of God. So one of the reasons Jesus comes is to say, let me show you, remember by my works, let me show you who God is. And you look at this and you're like, oh my gosh, this is literally a definition of who Jesus is, right? He is the Lord. Is Jesus the Lord? Oh, yeah, last time I checked, he walks on water. He raises people from the dead. He takes like just some little biscuit things and some fish and feeds like 20,000 people. He is the Lord of creation. He really is the Lord. Is Jesus the God of compassion and mercy? Oh, my gosh. Have you read the New Testament? <laughs> it constantly says Jesus was filled with compassion, so he healed them or he cast out demons. Jesus was moved with compassion and mercy, so he fed them. It, is Jesus slow to anger? Oh, my gosh. If I'd been Jesus and God, there'd be a lot more zapping going on when I was on earth. That's all I'm saying. Those Jewish leaders. <laughs> Jesus challenges them very hard out, but he's very gentle in the way he does it. And he only is rude or, or very challenging to the Jewish leaders. His own disciples ask the dumbest questions all the time. And Jesus just goes, <sighs> okay, guys, <laughs> let me explain it again. You know, <laughs> he's just so, he's so slow to anger. And then that last one, eh? filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Oh, my gosh. You can't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John without going, man. Jesus really loves people. <laughs> he really, really does, right? And I love that. So one of the things Jesus came to do is to say, man, you guys have lost this beautiful image of, of who God is that he explains in Exodus. It's got so jumbled. I want you to see who we are, who I am, right? <laughs> I love that. Okay, and then the last one is Jesus is the sacrifice. <laughs> Jesus is the, the sacrifice, um, that Israel had been longing for. Remember, they're, they're killing animals, and they're like, we know we're doing this because God asked us. We know it's not really removing sin because the animals aren't a mago day. Someone's coming, and then Jesus comes. And this bit just blew my mind when I was thinking about it this week. Jesus comes, and he has to be fully God and fully human. So he has to be fully God so he can pay for the sin of the world, right? So he can pay for everyone's sin. If he was just one person and he lived a perfect life, he could replace one person, Right? But because he's God, he can replace everyone. Makes sense, eh? And it'd be a substitute for everyone. But he has to be human to represent us. He can't be an angel. He can't be a whatever some other alien created. But he has to be human, right? But the crazy thing that I was, I was thinking about this week, it's like Jesus comes and he is, he is day, <laughs> and he's a Mago day. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that just blew my mind. He is God, but he's also in the image of God. And then you put this together and you just have this amazing, beautiful image of who Jesus is. He, that's why he is love. That's why he is compassion. That's why he is slow to anger. Because he's God, but he's also us, but he's the perfect version of us that he calls us to. Oh, I just love that, eh? I wanted to... This, I'm going to read a story, and it's kind of a bit weird, but I absolutely love it. It's a true story, and to me, this is such a cool, and it's only an illustration. It's a true story, but it's an illustration of God, right, and his love. And I've read it a bunch of times, and I debated, do I leave it in or out? And I was like, no, I, I love the imagery of the love of God, that, that Exodus example. He's slow to anger. He's filled with compassion. He's filled with love. So I, I just love this little story. So this is a true story from the Barcelona Olympics back in 1992. Let me read this. So, Britain's Derek Redman had dreamed uh, all his life of winning a gold medal in the 400 meter race, and his dream was in sight as he, uh, as the gun sounded in the semi-finals at Barcelona. He was running the race of his life and could see the finish line as he rounded the turn into the back stretch. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain go up the back of his leg, and he fell face first onto the track with a torn right hamstring. Woo! I'm going to get over emotional, which is all good. As the medical, sorry, as the medical attendants were approaching, Redmond fought to his feet. It was animal instinct, he would say later. He set out hopping <laughs> in a crazed attempt to finish the race. When he reached the back stretch, a large man in a t-shirt came out of the stands, um, <laughs> hurled aside a security guard and ran to Redmond, embracing him. It was Jim Redmond, Derek's father. You don't have to do this, he told his weeping son. 
Yes, I do, said Derek. Well then, said Jim, we're going to finish this together. <laughs> and they did. Fighting off security guards, the son's head sometimes buried in his father's shoulder. They stayed in Derek's lane all the way to the end as the crowd gasped, then rose and howled and wept. <laughs> Derek didn't walk away with a gold medal, but he walked away with an incredible memory of a father who, when he saw his son in pain, left his seat in the stands to help him finish the race. Oh, the story finishes with this. This is what God does for us. When we're experiencing pain and we're struggling to finish the race, we can be confident that we have a loving father who won't just let us do it alone. He left his place in heaven to come alongside us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. I am with you always, say Jesus, says Jesus to the very end of the age. Mm. I just love that illustration. I always think it'd be so easy for God to have just gone, <laughs> ever since the beginning, I've poured out love, I've poured out compassion, I've poured out reconciliation, and, forget, and you guys just keep stuffing it up, so I'm done. <laughs> Good luck on that planet. May the best man win, you know. I'm in heaven. I'm having a great time with the Trinity and the angels and all that. And you guys, good luck down there. But he doesn't. He sends himself and he dies. And I'm just like, wow, ah, just blows me away. All right. The next two are short, if you like. Oh, my gosh. Longest sermon ever. Um, the next two are real short. Um, number four, the church. I'm not even going to really do much on this because we talk about the church all the time here in church. Surprise, surprise. We're always talking through James and Ephesians and all these other books. So um, the simple thing is you see that same thread through all these letters um, from Paul and Peter and, um, and so on, talking about the same thing. The whole point in God designing this thing called the church is that he could dwell. He could be our God and we would be his people. That's why he calls us to come together every Sunday so that we're together as the people of God and God dwells in our midst. I love that. And again, the other three, continually God keeps saying to us, well, who will you obey? <laughs> will you obey yourself? Will you obey God? It's just that thread through the whole thing. And then the last one. So that was like several thousand years of history in five seconds if you were counting with the church. Here's the last one, right? The new heavens and the new earth. Um, the new heavens and the new earth. And, and when I get to the end of the story, I always do two things. I weep, looking back over the depravity and the brokenness of human history, and then I die laughing. Because when you get to the end, you realize the whole thing has been a giant loop. <laughs> Here's a verse right at the end of Revelation. And when you read this, you have to go, oh my gosh, he's literally talking about the garden. Let me read the verse, then I'll explain it. I know most of you know what I'm talking about. I love this verse. This is right at the end of, of human history, right? I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, and I want to add in finally, <laughs> God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And there's that key phrase, right? God is finally... Our God, we're finally his people. And so it always makes me go, oh, the depravity, all these thousands of years of human history. But at the same time, I die laughing because you literally get to the end, the, the second to last chapter in the Bible, and you're like, hang on, we're right back here. <laughs> we're right back in Genesis 1 where this whole thing started, where God created us to dwell with him and abide with him and, and be with him. And it's like, oh, my gosh. I get excited. You guys are not excited. I get excited. All right, stand up. Let me pray for us, today. Yeah. So I, it's kind of obvious, right? But as you're standing, I just have to finish with that, that little phrase I've kept saying, obey God or obey myself. <laughs> um, yeah, how are you doing on that? It, it's not easy. We're not Jesus. Jesus is the only one to live a perfect life. We mess, we sin. But God is always there like in that race. He's always there to come beside us. He doesn't stand in heaven pointing fingers. You sinners. Sort yourself out. He comes and stands with us and journeys with us. I'm sure weeps with us. Is there anything in your life that God's pointing out right now that the Holy Spirit's saying to you, hey, this is an area that you're not obeying me in. This is an area where you're just not being the people of God. You're being yourself. You've got to, we've got to talk about this. Eh? Yeah, kia ora atua. Kia ora ior the creator of all, the sustainer of all things. I, just, I love the story of the Bible. 
It always cracks them up. We get to the end and we're back where we started. <laughs> we're back where we started, dwelling with you, walking with you, abiding with you. You just asking us, how's your day gone? And we'll be able to finally face to face, it says, which is wild. Talk to you about our day. <laughs> Talk to you about our life. Talk to you about our struggles and our joys as our creator, but also as one who just loves us so intensely, God. Yeah, I just pray over the next uh, four weeks as we keep unpacking this big story of the Bible that you'll continue talking to us, eh? helping us to see more and more these key themes, these key threads that you're calling us to understand, but to apply to our lives. Eh? We really do want to be your people. We know we stuff up, but we want to be your people. We do desperately want you to be our God. Yeah, speak to us in these songs that we're going to sing now, this worship we're going to bring towards you. God, we, we, our ears are open, eh? We want to hear from you. Yeah, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen.